First of all, congratulations on the nomination. You've been with the department for some time. I want to dive right in to the report issued this week on the Climate Change Resilience Plan, um, 120 pages. What's the overall goal? The goal is to help New Jersey prepare for the climate impacts that we are experiencing now throughout the state and for those that we know are to come. We're dealing with a lot here in New Jersey. We have a risk of sea level rise increase that is greater than many other places on the planet. We have a risk of increased uh, storm intensity, storm frequency, uh, the urban heat island effect from rising temperatures. There is a lot to prepare for. Uh, and unfortunately, these conditions, they're only going to worsen. So we need to be ready. This plan that we've released this morning uh, with the First Lady uh, and Mayor McCormick over in Woodbridge, it sets the table, so to speak. It, it identifies the considerations that we all together need to be focusing on in order to build a more resilient New Jersey. So it's about adapting, I guess, because some of these items are inevitable. I mean, I think of some of the more tangible things that the department has done, buying homes in flood prone areas. Are there specifics though, or new regulations that you're proposing, the department is proposing to help achieve any of this? So in all of our climate work, from the perspective of reducing greenhouse gases or the perspective of building the state's resilience, we start with a foundational policy document that identifies the areas that we need to focus our attention. And then from there, you begin building the regulatory schemes and policy frameworks that move you forward. On the resilience side, we're already doing some of that. Uh, the Department of Environmental Protection uh, is preparing uh, a suite of rules uh, directed by the governor last year under Executive Order 100 uh, that we call New Jersey Pact or New Jersey Protecting Against Climate Threats. These are regulations that will help our communities, particularly those in coastal and uh, fluvial or riverine floodplain areas, uh, to understand the risks that are to come and to help to ensure that what we are building now will stand the test of time. So let's talk then about clean energy, which is, of course, a big part of this. Governor Murphy uh, has made it a large part of his plan, his overall environmental plan. Um, big goals there, yet the state still has new proposals for fossil fuel uh, plans in the works. Why not put a moratorium on that? One of the things that's really important to understand is that we need to facilitate a just transition to a clean energy economy. And there's many ways that we're working on that, from facilitating uh, some of the largest offshore wind uh, facilities uh, on the eastern seaboard. In fact, just yesterday, I was uh, with some international leaders talking about how New Jersey uh, is leading not just on the East Coast, but the entire country in offshore wind. However, we're not going to have steel in the water tomorrow. The first wind farm is probably not going to be online until at least 2024, right? So we're not flipping the switch off tomorrow on natural gas, for example. We have a very old building stock here in New Jersey, and we're going to need it for some time to come. But we have to be firing on all cylinders to move to that just uh, transition to clean energy. Uh, we have not built any new power plants in New Jersey in some time, and I don't believe any are under construction now. We know that, of course, uh, transportation is one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the governor has this plan. It's a 100% clean energy by 2050, ambitious goal. So how do you convince, incentivize, whichever words you want to use, the industry to invest in things like electric vehicles when we know it's uh, not easy to do and quite frankly, it costs a lot of money. So the way we do that, twofold. We have to incentivize, we have to invest, but we also have to use the mechanics of law and regulation to push people forward. Uh, we're doing that through a suite of reforms that we call climate pollutant reduction or CPR because if we do indeed need to perform CPR on New Jersey's environmental laws, 50 years old, they don't serve us into the future. 
And so just last week, we proposed a clean and advanced clean truck rule that will move manufacturers toward putting more uh, electrified heavy and medium duty trucks on the roads here in New Jersey. At the same time, we're investing uh, a great deal in our electric uh, vehicle infrastructure. Just uh, in February, we announced a $100 million investment in uh, environmental justice communities uh, for uh, awarding to local governments uh, things like electrified rapid transit buses, uh, electrifying garbage trucks, uh, electrifying port equipment that uh, for, to replace uh, diesel equipment that pollutes the air in some of our most vulnerable communities. We've got to take this one step at a time, but we're already ahead of the curve. We've already beat here in 2021 the uh, requirement for how many electric charging stations that we needed to deploy by 2025. So we're moving forward steadily, uh, but it will take some time. What, what does that mean? How does that translate to what you and I and everyone else can see changing in their daily lives or see improvements as far as um, the issues we've had with air pollution, especially in our, our urban areas? So number one, uh, to the extent that an electric vehicle is within your reach, you should reach for it. Uh, the state does have an incentive program that will take $5,000 off the cost of a new electric uh, vehicle, and that program is run by uh, my colleagues over at the Board of Public Utilities. Uh, but at the same time, we need to see that change in our daily lives. We need to see electric vehicle charging stations be as omnipresent as we do gas stations. And as we get there, uh, we will see direct benefits to, to the improvements in local air sheds. Because by moving to an electric vehicle, we are removing pollutants right from our own communities. Just think about the cars that idle in front of the schools where our children are educated. They don't deserve uh, to be the recipients of that pollution. What else, uh, Commissioner, is the department doing to look at how health outcomes for those communities, other communities around it? I feel like every month a new report comes out um, taking a look at just that. So one of the things that we are working on uh, and are very proud of uh, is that last year, Governor Murphy signed the most empowering environmental justice law in the country. And DEP is tasked with developing the regulatory framework to implement that. And we're gonna do something revolutionary. And it sounds almost a little silly, but because of the way that environmental law has materialized over the last 50 years, we don't actually look at the direct impacts of a pollution generating facility on its host community. We only ask ourselves whether that pollution generating facility uh, is using the best technology to limit emissions, but we don't look to see what's going on in that community already. Will an additional facility be the straw that breaks that community's back? We need to look at that question and that's what we're gonna do. No state in the country does it. We're going to be the first and we are darn proud of it. So you've been on the job as in the acting commissioner uh, position now for about a week. What is your priority now moving forward? Um, and what benchmarks, if any, do you see needing to be moved in some of these plans? We have so much work to do. Uh, luckily, I've been at DEP for the last two and a half years as uh, number two to the incomparable Catherine McCabe, and we had begun a lot of great work together. We need to amplify and accelerate all of it. Our response to climate change, first and foremost, we need to make sure that we are reducing emissions everywhere we possibly can. Uh, but in addition to that, it is so important that we build our resilience and that we enhance our water infrastructure. We have a $30 billion need for water infrastructure improvements in this state. And we all hold such great hope for what we'll see coming out of infrastructure dollars from Washington, how we direct those investments, how we improve the lives of our communities and the health of our residents by improving upon our water infrastructure uh, will be, uh, I hope, one of our continued great successes. Just over the last three years, our administration has facilitated $1.5 billion uh, in water for infrastructure improvement projects. We've got to keep that going and keep it going uh, as fast and as uh, more accelerated uh, as we possibly can because it improves people's lives. It improves our economy. Uh, I fully believe that businesses come and stay in New Jersey 
because we have a healthy people, a strong people, a clean environment, and we can continue to build upon that. Acting Commissioner Shalma Tarat, thank you for your time. It is my pleasure. Thank you.